What's up, everybody? We are back and uh, spiritual experience. I got my good boy Jesus with me. What's up? What's up? Jesus just celebrated five years in a row, even though he was he was bouncing in and out a little while, playing playing footsie with AA. And um, holiday time is coming. It was funny because this is uh, this is what I'm I'm thinking about now. But I've been thinking about it since your anniversary. You're saying that we're Puerto Rican and we. Start celebrating. We start celebrating on Christmas, and we don't stop till Three Kings, January sixth, baby. Yeah, and it had me thinking because, like, my mom is from Puerto Rico, and Jesus is is Puerto Rican, and like, so we come from this culture, and we're both now in recovery, and like to grow out of that, it's a it's a monumental thing. So, what I where I want to kind of start with you is really like, where do you come from? What are your parents like? What was it like for you growing up? First and foremost, I'd like to thank you for uh, getting me here all the way to Bushwick uh, to record this. I would like to also thank my higher power and everybody in the the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for keeping me sober today, you know, one day at a time. I'm blessed and grateful that we we'll get to sit here and do this for people who, who are going to listen and who need this, who are hurt, suffering, whatever the case may be. If we can help one person, we did our job today. And I, I just want to thank you with that. So born and raised, 53rd Street was my stomping ground, Sunset Park, Brooklyn, my whole entire life. My mom was a born-again Christian. She was the goody two-shoes. She always went to church. She never drank, never did drugs. That that was something that was not in her story. And uh, my father, complete, total opposite. My father was uh, Salcedo. I don't know if you guys, uh, if you're a real old school salsa dude, uh, his band was La Fuerza Latina. He had eight records. He was with Combo Records. This guy, you know, he was, he, he, he was there, you know, he was uh, performing every night. So my mom had to deal with those four in the morning, five in the morning, late night show ups, whacked, you know, he crashed in the car. He got Cadillacs. My father had money. You know, I, I went to private school. I went to St. Agatha. If anybody's from Sunset, you already know what St. Agatha is. And, and for someone like, like my mom who doesn't know how to read and write, I don't even think she even went to high school. You know, she had her first child at 16 years old and her kids were her life from, from day one. My father was just cocaine and, and alcohol. That was his thing. That's like most salsa singers do. That like Most of their good music that came out, that was salsa. The, the guys who were on drugs, you know, that's just what it was. They got high and they did music. 53rd Street is where I grew up, you know, single mother. My grandmother was a store owner. So kind of like the reason why we had a home and and a roof over our head was one, my mom's love, but two, my grandmother's finances because she was a a bodega owner on 7th Street and 4th Avenue for quite some time. And she was the one that, uh, that bought the home that we lived in. 36 years, I would say. Was your dad like around all the time or was he in and out of your life? What's the story? So my father is crazy because we're, we're close. Uh, he's a Rosado. For some reason, my mom like migrated to, to the Rosado side because everyone now lives in Orlando and we're so close. My father's 16 brothers and sisters. They, they all lived. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the cousins are insane, bro. And, and they multiply. Every, every cousin had more babies. So we're deep in, in Orlando. You know, my mom is just, she was always around them because when they would perform, she would be with the ladies. While mm. the men performed, it was eight brothers. If you look them up, you'll see. You know, it was eight brothers that was in this band, and and the wives went to dance and watched them perform. She, Sounds like a great time for her. Yeah, she she danced with Eddie Pacheco, La Fania, like you know the people that she saw and the places that she's been, which is to me still amazing because she never drugged or drank, which was sick. It's so crazy. Her life was so she's so naive. We were at a Thanksgiving dinner. One room had tons of cocaine on the table. My mom literally thought it was flour. Uh. That's how naive she was. And then the lady was like, "Wait a minute, does she not know what you guys do?" And my mom was like, "What the." I'm taking my kids out of here. So they had to move all the drugs out of the building into some other stash house just so we could have Thanksgiving dinner. There. But that's just so you could understand how that's not her her life. That's not, she has no idea what that is. Even with me, even with me, she didn't, the things that she found in the apartment, she was still in denial. Even to the end of the day, you could even ask, she was still be like, oh, but my son said he's not drinking. Meanwhile, I'm like whacked every night. And, and the wife would be like, are you kidding me? What do you mean? You know, like you're not living this life, but um, that's what mothers do. You know, they're, they're enablers. A lot of them are, but but it's not even <clears throat> there. Number one, I identify completely. Look, my mom also came from Puerto Rico, has uh, three sisters and four brothers, big family, and I have a thousand cousins, and we we grew up with uh, a lot of food, loud music, kids running around everywhere, alcohol everywhere. 
some cousins running in and out of the bathroom. But like that was like the soil. I didn't know anything else. I just knew that. I just knew like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, like all my aunts would be doing each other's hair. And like my uncles, they they smelled like Budweiser <laughs> cans and Aqua Velva. Bacardi, baby. Yeah, Bacardi. Oh, my God. And it was just a different time. This is like the 80s in New York. So this is like all of my... When, when cocaine and cigarettes was cool. <laughs> yeah. And that was like... It, it, it was the vanity. It was everything. It was, But there, there was nothing else. So then if you just do what you know, it's very easy to like lose your way. So coming out of this environment, like when did you find your way into like the street? For me, I mean, I, I was <laughs> walking to school was the streets. Right. I had to pass the Latin King house. I had to pass La Familia house. I was, grew up in a time that the gang corners started slowing down. So they, were, they weren't wearing vests like they used, like dirty ones and the MCs and the 49ers and the and the big yaks. And, the, and, and, and years ago in the 80s, the people stood in their corner with their leather vests, like, like the movie, The Warriors. It was, that's what it was. Right. But I was a little past that. So- the streets was already going to school was already in me. You got to go to school. So now you got to go with somebody whose brother's a big time drug dealer or this person is selling drugs and he's only 14, 15 years old. And I started cutting hair at 14, 15 years old. So already at a barber shop compared to the kids at 15 at this age and time, like that's night and day. So you it's know. similar to like your dad, like I said, he has this magic in, in one hand and then you, you inject yourself into this culture cutting hair in the barbershop boom that that's yeah. where it is yeah that, that's that's every drug dealer every person oh. everybody in the hood every oh what can you get all the bochinche which is called gossip for those who ain't spanish you know right. you get everything that happens in the hood is gonna go through a barbershop i don't care what anybody says like that's just what it is it's, that's the guy's gossip that's the soap opera for men like this is where we talk shit about everybody else is, is the barbershop but there's a lot of love in there too oh no yeah and, for sure and you're now you're for getting sure. this love this is what you know. This is your soil. This is what you know. So you start cutting hair. Where do you start? Well, what happened was my mom couldn't afford. Once my pops left, there was no more St. Agatha. I was going now to PS94. Now it's public school. We went from Catholic to public overnight, which I wasn't really mad. I didn't like wearing the suit. To tell you the truth, but I was actually like, thank God. Because, you know, these nuns hitting me with rulers was getting out of control. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yo, and I got to wear this shit all day? Like, whatever. But she couldn't afford what I wanted. You know, the Jordans, the polo, the weed. <laughs> so so when did, when did you start really partying with these guys? So, drinking and so nah, I mean, you, you're going to high school. So right before high school, I, was, I used to rap. I was, you know, that was, everybody wants to be a rapper or a basket. The money, yeah, too. Yeah, that too. You want to spend, you know. You see these dudes, you know, you got your boys who are wearing like, like heads or jocks. Then you got your other boys rocking brand new Jordans. And you're like, I want that. So how do you get that? You can't, mom, let me get $200. They're going to look at you like, are you kidding me? That's a whole week's compra. So I'm like, all right, so I'm going to have to get it myself. Did you have like people maybe in your family or maybe in your neighborhood that you knew that was like going on the straight and the narrow path that you knew that you were like, oh, this is my boy since we were like 10 years old. Uh. But then- Ah, you lost your way. That's a tough one, you know, because there were church kids that there was they got the the people down the block, Jehovah Witness. Yeah, but then their daughter was pregnant by fifteen. You know, then you had this other Catholic hardcore. But then the husband goes home and drinks and beats their kids at night. There's a lot of hypocrisy. Oh yeah, you, that's and you see that as a kid. I saw. You're, yeah, you're like so. Like for me, there was like this thing where Jay's dad is white, right? My dad's, my dad's a Long Island Jew. He's crazy, but he's a Long Island Jew. And my mom is like from Puerto Rico. So like there would be this thing. The Puerto Rican Jew, baby. Right. So there would be this thing where it's just like, okay. And we didn't really know a lot of my dad's family. So in my mom's family, like they're all tough Puerto Ricans from the 70s. I always say my mom's from Puerto Rico only because there's a difference between somebody who's like from the island and somebody yeah, no, who's yeah, first yeah. generation 1, in New York. So like- when we were growing up, like all my first cousins were all first born here. So like my aunt and my share the same naive, like your mom, like my mom didn't know what drugs was like, cause she's from an Island in the, in the middle of the Caribbean. You know, she thought everything was crack. Cause it was like the eighties. She's like, oh, you, you. but then there was this other stigma. You know, I had a sister and uh, she's no longer with us. 
She's dearly missed. She went to school and she did all of the right things. And me, I, you know, I gravitated towards the fun, right? So that, but even our own family would be like, oh, Jay's the Puerto Rican one and, and D's the white one because she was doing the right thing. So even in our own culture, <laughs> yeah. it's like self, yeah. self hating. Yeah. You're like, oh my God, you, you're going to college where you want to be white? Like it was that kind of thing during that time. And I know that was like everywhere. Where like I mean, when you bring a bunch of dudes that j- lived on an island, right? Yeah. And you bring them to Harlem, and they see all these new cultures. So they were like, "Holy shoot! There's Asian, there's white. I could talk to all these people." So they were like, "Oh, this is brand new." So I mean, if you ship all these people over to to Harlem and the Bronx inside of a project, what what do you think is gonna happen? They wanted you, oh, you Boricua, you got to be tough. You better you better carry a knife in your back pocket. Yeah, and somebody like, no, you better not cry. Crying's for, oh, for pussies. Oh my god, you couldn't you couldn't cry. Share then, emotions. Yeah. Tell me how you feel. Unheard of. Inside part of me yeah, complied. Yeah. And then the alcohol. Me too. I'm the, not gonna tell you how I feel. I can't right. tell you. It's a weakness. Vulnerability is a weakness. That was a weakness back in the day. So alcohol and drugs, they they allowed me to be that now as a as a as a sober man. Like I call it like we had a costume on. The alcohol and the drugs allowed me to have that costume on where like, you don't think I'm Puerto Rican? I'll have 11 people drag you in the street right now. It's all BS. We were talking about it at your anniversary. We were just like this whole machismo thing that was almost like it wasn't force fed you, but it was like when you grow out of it, you're like, dude, there are people taking penitentiary chances for 1200 bucks, 1500 bucks well, that they don't even know that like, listen, we can show you. Fast forwarding to now, like we can show you that you don't have to be that guy from 1992 on 53rd Street anymore. No. Like you don't, you don't no. have to be. And it's okay. And it's okay to love God and it's okay to cry yes. and it's okay Amen. to, yeah, like, 1, but when you're in there and you're cutting hair and everybody's got the cars and everybody's got the girl, it's very hard to say no. <laughs> <laughs> there was no no. It was like more. <laughs> so then as you go through school, How'd you finish high school? What'd you do? Well, there's a theory for me, you know, for, for thugs on, on the block and thugs in the corner. And even with the Lion Kings and like, they wanted me to be part of that culture. So, you know, I've always felt it's like I fight for a brother, someone that I grew up with, someone that I rock with, somebody that I, I live a day to day basis with, like someone snuffs them with fighting. For me, this was my logic. I can never risk my freedom and life for a, a complete stranger. Mm. That to me was just unheard of. Even going to jail, like there was I line. rock with myself. You got neutral. That like that's it, bro. I'm here for me. I'm not here for you. Like that's it. I just want to get get out and go home and call it a day. But you know, you gotta think all these broken homes. So many single mothers in Sunset Park. Oh my god. There's, that's the percentage is probably way over fifty percent. So you have these broken homes. So what do you, there's no love at at the home. Even if your mom gave it to you, that's not. It wasn't. It was just different. You know, you, you, we were searching for that acceptance on the street. The choices were so limited. And that's why we say now, like pre-internet, like now you can be home and you can learn anything you want and you can see. Oh, yeah. yeah. Other, you couldn't see you out could of your own neighborhood. Life at home. You could, <laughs> back in the day, you couldn't see out of your own neighborhood. This is your whole world. This is all everything, that you knew. Everything. So like it, you almost don't have a choice, you know, to expect a, a young person to not go down this path when he's born into this soil. You're asking a lot. You know, malt liquor, Old English, yeah. Coke 45. Oh my God, what yeah. are you drinking? At 15 years old, before getting into school, even getting into school, I'm in the alleyway freestyling, drinking 40s with Hawaiian punch in it. Like, yeah. that's, you know, smoking blunt after blunt, $5, $2 chip down, the extra dollars for the Philly. Like, that, that's what we did. We were chasing a high. We weren't. And it's crazy because let's bring up the sister thing. You know, I have a sister. She. Out of even going clubbing, my sister used to go to the tunnel, 54, Studio 54, Limelight. Oh, shit was the tunnel, though, and Palladium. But she never did drugs or drank like that. And She came out of the same home as you. Same went home. Whole, went completely way. different. Back to what you're saying. All right. I, I, I was a great student. I, I played sports, bro. I played in high school. I played baseball, basketball, tennis. On the team, like tennis, mm. two years, baseball, I think a year, and and basketball, two years, while drinking and hanging out. Ah, uh, at that point, I mean, I did, but it wasn't like I like sports. Yeah, you know, it got more crazy. Like when I started hitting, you know, you come home right after the game, then you're playing on Fifty Sixth Street Park on the corner. What are they doing? They're drinking forties and playing ball yeah. oh, till two in the morning. So you know, you you're smoking. I was definitely smoking. 
Yeah, yeah. I wasn't really drinking because you can't play ball drunk like that. No. Just you, that, that shit don't work. But nah, I wasn't like the, that. That I was. I wasn't an alcoholic yet. You know. I mean, I drank. When did you cross the line? You think? Looking back, of because, alcoholism. Yeah, because we wake up and we're already been over the line for so long that we don't even know when. You have sports. You have everything going for you. You're a good student, and then next thing you know. You're on the, I don't. You're on the I mean, corner. there's so many lines that were crossed. You know, I wouldn't even know which one because when I cut hair, picture I have. Let's say if I cut twelve people in a day, right? They each bring a six pack. <laughs> Do the math. Twelve yeah. times six is a lot of beers. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if my birthday's on New Year's Eve, wow. So what was I getting that day? I was getting bottles, bro. My, my I would have like thirty bottles on my table, like just mm. sitting there. Like so, this is what happens, bro. I feel like in life we were trained into believing that to have a social event or to have fun or to be yourself or to be yourself or to let free that you had to have a few drinks. You have to have a few drinks so you can feel free and you don't have to have those insecurities that you have in your mind already. Because you know when you drink, you don't care. I don't even know if. Like, cause for me, like, I didn't even feel insecure until I stopped drinking. Like, I just thought that like, you drink while you drive. You drink. Well, that's while what you, I'm saying. Like society, yeah, look at the commercials. Yeah. Like, look at the commercials. But how they glamorize at, it. Look at what you know. Like, if my aunts are all doing each other's hair, but if they're drinking water, like they're drinking beer. Well, that's like another thing. It's thing. like even all right. You you're getting older. You're like 17 or whatever. You, you meet a chick. You're not gonna be like, hey, would you like to go to the museum? You could do that now, yeah. but you was a hey. herb yeah, in yeah. our day yeah. hey. if you did that. No, that's that's when you get intimate. But your first thing is like, yo, what's up, girl? You we're gonna meet at the, the bar. That's good? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. your first date. Yeah. So now you're talking to a person that's not even you use a boat and you're probably gonna end up smashing because you're both drunk. That's yeah. the, you wake up the next day like what happened? Yeah. On your first date, in reality, you should just be meeting the person and getting to know her. And it's backwards. And it's like, let's get whacked and see what happens and blah, blah, blah. You yeah. know, that's how kids were born. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's how kids, the strange kids were born this shit. But it's a society thing, bro. It's like, it's a business. It's money. You know what I mean? And we get caught up in the rapture because we weren't taught better. We're good in manipulating and lying. So our parents don't have no tools. They came, they have zero tools. Yeah. But what do we expect from them? Yeah, it's it's crazy because um, even when we were on the way here and like you're FaceTiming with your mom, like my mom's almost 80, man. She don't know how to use FaceTime. Ah, yeah. It took a while, though. Yeah. That shit didn't just happen. That's trust so me. Funny. <laughs> Yeah, and there's times that she's with me and she can't. I can't see her because she don't know where the button yeah, is. To, to, but yeah, to thing. turn. The- <laughs> yeah, but she loves you, and she never. Abandoned That's all that matters. You. She never abandoned. That's you. all that matters. So how did you fall down the rabbit hole, and how did you get out? So you know, drinking because that's what we do. Friday night, like, oh, we're all gonna meet at the park. You get this bottle. What bottle we get? And you know, we we chose different bottles every week to see which one got us more high. I don't know if y'all remember Zima, but Zima yeah. was one of my first drunks. I was drinking Zima clear beer, <laughs> and that was like the first time the room was spinning. And you're like, I'm never gonna do this again. Oh my god! And then you're like, oh my god, throwing up in your sink. And then the next day, you're doing the same shit. You know, mm-hmm. and that's where it started for me. I think it was Zima, believe it or not. When I got my real first like blackout drunk on 53rd Street, you know, drinking with the Chinese the person next door. But, they, you know, again, these are times that pe- everybody was outside. I could hear my mom screaming for me to eat dinner. Yeah. You know, there was no inside. It was like, I never want to go inside. You had to like pry me to the bed for me to stay inside. So outside was the shit. We were always outside. So, you know, what you doing outside? One person's drinking a 40. Let's get two. Let's yeah. get three. And then Friday will come. Let's get the bottle. All right. So that's the way it started. It's cutting hair. I always had Heineken. I always had a Heineken. Heineken was my shit. I was always drinking a Heineken while cutting hair. So it progressed there. And then, you know, I had my sister in my life. So my mom, not knowing how to read and write, she was real adamant about us going to school. Like, she pounded school in us. Like, hey, Sus, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And my sister's like, uh, what are you, a loser? <laughs> and then I'm looking at this NYU graduate like, yo, I don't, I'll never, I, I can't feel that shoes. Like, I was already, like, put down already. Like, I, I can't, I can't be her. Right. You know, I can't be her. I can never be her. So I was already intimidated. Right. right. From from going to school. But again, you know, my mom was like, you got to do something. You got to do something. You got to do something. So I was like, all right, 
I'll go to college. I'll go away. I go to, and then the only college that accepted me was Delhi, right? Which was a SUNY upstate. And if you all know Oweana, aka Stoniana, that was like the neighboring school, which we, that's where we did our chilling hard. So when I got up there, the alcohol went from like just drinking to like an event. It became like a sport. That's when I feel like my drinking like graduated to another level because now, it's it's okay to drink on Mondays, like Misty Mondays, Terrific Tuesdays, Wet Wednesdays, Thirsty Thursdays, Freaky Friday. Yo, every night there was a keg party. You know yeah, what I mean? I you arrived. I was like, woo, this is... Now, I was a barber, so I was cutting hair. Then the cocaine came in, because then some some dudes that I rocked with, which is like the Dominicans and the, and the Puerto Ricans, and then, and, you know, the blacks, they were just, we just, that money-making mentality from the street. Yeah, we you were click bringing up. It, you we click were up. bringing it to, to college, like, yo, I can get weight, or we can get this, and you're selling grams for fucking $60. It was just a killing. This is 96, 97. You're making a killing, dude. A killing. I would go uptown, buy these bags of these Knicks that were huge, and then go to college and sell them for $20, bro. So, you know, then that came into play. So now I didn't even care about school. It was all about making money. How long were you up there? <laughs> One year. <laughs> Academic dismiss was just, thank God, that was the best thing that happened to me because every, there was a, a detective that was playing a student for a whole year. and t- it took 21 bro, Jump Street style? Bro, dude, I, I'm not, no shitting you. I swear to God. So thank God because a lot of, they got arrested, my whole team, like six of them. And mm. some of them did one to three. And this girl had to put up, her mom had to put up her laundry mat. Oh just God. to bring her out to the, you know, for like. For bail. Yeah. So it was the blessing because I remember the first time going up because I was still bringing them stuff. So mm-hmm. I would do trips back and forth. And I remember one day going up there and, and, and Gil was like, yo, he was like, cut it, cut it. Yo, dude, he's, he, we had the softball field and he's like to his neck. He's telling like, yo, cut, 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 cut. So I got shook. So I did a U-turn, went back to some forest and stashed what I had brought up. And then I drove back. I'm like, what happened? He's like, yo, Jesus, they all got fucking back last night, bro. Every single one of them. I'm like, so they're watching us. I'm like, oh, fuck. And then I came home, right? And back to my shits, cutting hair. Started cutting hair. And then my mom wanted me to go to, you need school. You need school. So I was like, all right, I'll go to vocational school, 18 months, which was for art. You mm-hmm. know, that was cool. That's where I got my two-year degree. I was smoking, you know, I smoked weed from morning till night. Like, that's just what I, that's what I did. And then with the cutting hair, my mom's still pressuring me. Now I'm like 20 years old. Then I got into the, oh, forget it. When I came home, it was straight club scene. 16, 17, one, even before I went to college, I was already going to clubs. When I came back, it was like, now I'm older. So now I don't have to sneak in. This is like, we're hitting it. And then the nightlife brought ecstasy came into play. Oh God, ex fucking ecstasy. <sighs> forget about when that came into play it was like for me at that moment it was like heaven it's like this is the best club drug in the world you love everybody Mm. you love everybody not knowing that you're destroying your serotonin fluids which is like your happiness fluids in your body anyway that's a whole different thing but yeah i got into the club scene so now i'm clubbing thursday friday saturday sunday some days on the weekdays now i'm promoting and while doing this my friends are drug dealers so they're like yo jesus Take this package, you bring it over here. We'll give you this much money. Oh, hey, Seuss, you know this person. Tell him I got this, and I'll give you that. So me being the barber, the middleman was easy. It was like, yo, I'm going to introduce you to A. B got the work, so cut me off. I don't want nothing. I just want free drugs, kid. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. I'll cut your head. Just still give me $100 for the haircut. Cut me, I don't know, seven grams. And when we go clubbing, you're buying, buying the bottles anyway. Did you think you was an addict? At that point, no, I thought it was just fun. Isn't that crazy? No, yeah. Well, I didn't know what a black... What's now. crazy, how you say that, because I thought a blackout meant a great time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I learned blackout my first rehab at, mm. at 30 years old. Right. So how do you get from there to your first rehab? That's a 10-year that's a falling so, down the So hole. now 22, 23, now I'm just selling drugs. I'm in the cars. I'm in the hotels. I, I would go on crack routes. I'll do like shifts. You do 12 hour shifts. And then that shift, you, you can make like $600 that day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you get two, three shifts a week. And you get, if you get a Friday night Saturday, you can make 1800 Like, bing, bang. It's funny because we, we were talking about it before. At that time in your life, when you don't even know what you can do, 
six hundred bucks is a lot of money. Oh, forget it. For the chance that you're taking, it's a, a Versace in a, shirt in a, ho- <laughs> in a in a hotel room. You're taking this felony chance. You're not s- thinking about that. I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah. I was just thinking, how can I get away with it? Yeah, like, I could dip and dive. Like, I just thought I was smarter than the cops. Oh. They couldn't get me. That's what you're thinking. I'm not saying. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> But thank, by the grace of God, thank God I never got arrested for nothing. Like, thank God. You know, I flew under the radar in that aspect. I always got arrested for stupid shit. Like, either fighting or smoking or having something on me. You know, I never got caught with like heavyweight. Thank God. But I also wasn't like, I would like double dutch. I'll go in and out. You know, I didn't want to be mainstream drug dealer because I already knew what kind of life that meant. One, I had to carry a gun. One, the fear. I didn't like walking in fear through the streets like someone's going to get me. I didn't like that. So I was like, the like I said, I was the barber. That's it. I was the barber that, got, that can get you whatever you want. Right. So what happened next? You know, my mom kept saying like, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And um, I thought promoting and cutting hair was good enough for me. I was still making a thousand. And then on the other little shit that I would do, you know, when you're selling all these drugs, you, you start thinking like, oh, we're going to open up a laundromat or we'll open up a barbershop. But little do you know is that every time you go to the club, you're spending the money you made that week. So if I made like $1,500, I'll go to the club and buy three bottles. Which was like three, six, nine, nine hundred dollars. Then you got a tip. Then you got to go to the hotel. Then you got to pay for the clothes that you're wearing. Then I was into Versace. So a shirt would be like four hundred dollars. Yeah. So, you know, again, that it's a costume. I thought as a costume, I realized one of my character defects was the attention seeking. Like, I guess that my father never gave me what mm-hmm. I don't know what it is. It I was guess. never enough. It was no, I wanted every when I walk in the room, I want everybody to look at me like, yo, Jesus is in the building. Yeah. So if I had to wear a six hundred dollars shirt with the matching six hundred dollars pair of shoes, then that's what I'll do. But that's like that hood rich shit, you know, like because if you if you think about it in reality, if someone taught me like invest a new annuity huh. investment or even yo, let me tell you, I'm forty three years old. I got sober at thirty eight, right? Even when I got I just learned about credit. Credit. I know dudes right now that their kid is only one years old and they're establishing credit for their kid, bro. The kid's not even like five years old. They're already establishing credit because they know in the future that his score be up, the annuities are in his name. Like, I didn't know none of that shit. I told you, I didn't even know what my what credit score was until fucking five years ago. Yeah, I, it took me the first five years of my recovery before I got good credit. And I had a little bit of money when I got in here. So when did you meet your wife? Is this when you met her during no, this No, no, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I met her when I was like during the club scene. Uh, but she went to high school with me, you know, uh, so. You knew her already? It's so crazy. Yeah, I knew her already. Was so, I'm going to tell you what really happened. So my boy Deep, the weed dealer. Deep was a graffiti writer, weed dealer. He was a polo head, you know. He was my boy. He was a Jew. Speaking of Jews, he was, nice. he was the Jew in the town, you know. He was a, a graffiti kid, low kid, whatever. But he was the weed guy. He knew I was on the route for my shit or my whatever the guy I worked for shit and he was just like yo can you see these girls for me bro I can't yo I got like three custies that I, I don't want to lose bro and he's like hey Seuss one of them has like six hot chicks bro bring them a 50 of weed and, and, and please please just just give it to them I was like ah cause I knew where his stash was whatever we where everything was so I went to go serve them weed. <laughs> That's how that, that rekindled. Like, so, you know, I'm clubbing and I was a dude that I was always in a rental. I never really liked standing on the corner and drinking like that. That, that made no sense for me. Like five dudes, six dudes on a corner all night drinking. Like they're wearing iceberg and, and like seven thousand, ten thousand dollar chains. Like, yo, dude, you're hot. Like you letting the cops know who the fuck you are. Like I, that I never understood. I never understood that. So my thing was like, yo, I'm trying to bag as many women and I'm trying to hit the clubs. Like, I want to go to Jersey, Queens. I'm not, I don't want to stay Sunset Park. The fuck out of here. I never understood that shit. Like you ain't catching me. So I was always like the pretty boy with the tight shit, with the shoes. So I, I and I was, cl- I was clubbing. I was clubbing. If you weren't clubbing, then I, I wasn't fucking with you. I didn't really give a fuck what you were doing. So she was like, yeah, we're going to this spot. And I'm like, oh shit, I right, no doubt. Then I'm going to that spot. Let me, let me bring call one of my boys up you know i had the guap so it didn't matter i'm like i'm buying a bottle no matter what so wherever i'm going i didn't really need anyone and that's the way that started you know it just started like that yeah so then how do you get from there from like clubbing guy to like you know 28 
you know, she went to her clubs. Then I went to my clubs. We'll meet up at four in the morning. It was like that kind of, we're young. So we were yeah, just yeah. like, it was like, that's the way shit went. You know, you like, you knew a chick, you fucked with her. You weren't dating. I, I like, I mean, it, it, you were together, but it was like, you know, when we meet, when we link up, we link up. Cause we, she went clubbing too. So I, she didn't want to stop her life neither. So, you know, my mom, again, kept saying, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? So at like 27, because I was getting locked up. Uh, it was just like a recurring, like just waking up, just feeling shitty, doing the same thing over. Waking, yo, bro, I would wake up and take a half an ecstasy pill before I even eat something and go like shopping at the mall on, on fucking ecstasy. My mom was getting sick and tired of it because now I'm in and out of her house. She's finding drugs. Like there was one time she found a thousand pills of ecstasy and tried to hide it on me. And I had to be like, yo. Did you think that you were like turning into your dad in some ways? I was my dad. There's no way. There was no some ways. I was him. I didn't know that yet. Right. It's so weird how that happened. Oh, it was already like, like in the making. Right. And it's it's like um, womanizing. It, yeah. Not caring about the other person. Subconsciously. Yeah. Like oh. you, you have this gravitational thing that's bringing you to this thing that caused you all this freaking pain. Bro, I would tell myself I'll never be like my father. And here you are. Vivid memory I had was my, my father cheating on, on my mom, obviously. And then him trying to come to the house, starting shit with my mom while the chick is around the corner in the car with him because he would drop me off home, walk around the corner, and then he pushed my mom down the stairs. That was a big resent. You know, I wanted to kill yeah. I, I picked up a knife and was trying to stab him. I literally might have caught him on the leg a little. I never really asked him to this day. But that was my childhood memory was seeing my father cheat and pretty Be much, and, and, and tell his kids, go fuck yourselves. Like, he didn't really care about us. You know what I'm saying? He just showed up. He really didn't care about us. That was all just, I don't know, whatever the case may be. But I wonder what your mom thought seeing her son. I think like denial, that. man. You know, yeah. I think denial, you know, she surpassed most of, you know, she's a mother, bro. She doesn't never see the evil. Mothers never see the evil the kids do, bro. A lot of them are enablers because they don't want to see it. And That's the love. denial. They love. The they love, love is you. no matter what. You could be a fucking junkie, bro. I know heroin addicts that their mothers still keep them in the basement and love them. They're like yeah. 50 years old, bro. And they still think that they're like their little babies, enabling them. But that's... that's but that's now a, you're approaching your mother. 30s. So now I'm... Right? So I'm, at one point that I was like, fuck, I got to do something with my life. Drug shit is just... Is, I never fully engaged. Like, I, again, I was a dabbler because I knew so many people. So I dabbled. Right. So, you know, I'm getting to a point like, what am I doing in my life? What am I doing? And um, then I did what every other kid did and that, that was trying to do something with their lives. I took the sanitation test, the fire department, tolls and bridges, which don't exist anymore. The steam fitters test, the carpenters test. Now I'm going for all tips, waiting on lines. And, and I had the time. So I was like waiting on lines. Bro, going, going to these lines right after the club is hilarious. If I tell you stories, she'd be like, what the fuck? I'll be at the front of the line with like a <laughs> dipped up. Everyone's like in construction clothes. I'm leaving the club. <laughs> Coming from a hotel so I could wait on line so I could get this plumber's, like the steam for this test. You know what I mean? So I did that. Like I was taking the tests and I was passing them. And by the grace of God, at 29 years old, I got a call two years after. Thank God, bro. Everything happens for a reason. But at 29, I got a call from the steam fitters program i was like yes what's the more insanity is that at this time i'm doing coke i'm doing fucking ecstasy i wasn't into like the zannies yet i didn't get to that point yet i'm an upper i'm an upper i'm a club drug guy i'm a club drug guy i, I don't suffer from depression I, I i i'm happy i'm out i just i suffer from wanting more that's the thing i suffer from you know right so you get okay. called and what happened? So I get called and, and, and I get in. But the, the quick, real quick insanity part was that they gave me six months before the piss test. Can I tell you that I did fucking drugs until like the fifth day? I stopped weed because, you know, weed, I, I didn't like down. So I, I, I was able to brush weed off, you know. So I was like, I stopped weed like two months before because I'm like, you need like a month. Right? Everybody knows the days, 30 day rule. So I'm like, let me give myself 60 days. At least I know I'm, I'm fresh and clean, but I still could do coke. So I'm like, all right, three more weeks. Now nah, I'm good. Two more weeks. I'm still good. One more week. You're like, ah, I'm pushing it. Now you're like on the fifth day. You're like, holy shit. How mm. am I going to get this out of my system? I got a piss test in two days. So now this, the world got me drinking vinegar. 
I, I'm asking all types of dudes that that got in <laughs> like around that that time. They're like, yo, drink vinegar, do the washout. This is when GNC came out with the cleansing shit. Yeah, but yeah. now, like, yo, they test for the cleansing. The golden seal. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. So they're like, yo, they test for the golden seal now. So you can't really use that. So I just, yo, listen, man. I just I drank mad water, man, and and I got in. I got in. So now I get into this fucking union. And years ago, the union alcohol was accepted. It was so accepted that if you didn't fucking drink with the foreman during lunch, you were snitch. So if you didn't drink with the boys, you were a little bitch. Like, why is he not drinking with us? So when I got into the union as an apprentice, my job was to get coffee, sandwiches, or whatever the guys wanted. And I was on a big job, so I had like 36 guys I had to go out for. But I had to also pass out tall boys that's what the for some reason that's what union guys drink tall boys 16 ounces so i had to like buy 30 16 ounces but make like a a, a cooler that you couldn't see in so i had a hand truck with crates the bottom crate would be all the beer f- nice and cold and all the food on top you put the food on top so the cold and hot don't don't stay within the other they don't yo, are you kidding me i'm fucking just coming off the the street and on top of i was selling coke I was making a killing. These fucking dudes are coming from upstate Pennsylvania. Like, yo, Jesus, give me fucking 10 of them. I'm like, dude, I only got six of them. I would have to call my boy like, yo, you got to come to the job site, bro. Like, they need like fucking, just bring a whole shitload, bro. They're going to go. So here you are trying to assemble. Assemble a job, a career, a, a career. You're, you're in this. And I, and, I, and I struck gold in my mind. Like, yeah. yeehaw. Now I could drink. Now they teach you, forget. See, college was, was a sport. Being a union member you become a man. Yeah. yeah I'm going to teach you how to drink like a man. And then what happens? Yeah. I'm, now I'm drinking. That's when the morning drinking started. Oh. That's when I'm packing up at seven in the morning, smashing them, bang, bing, pow, smashing them, doing bumps, filling up these fucking things. I'm not even paying for my beers because my order is so big. They're not even watching me. You know what I'm saying? They trust me. So I'm drinking and I'm, yo. So the, oh my God. And, and, and there was an apprenticeship program which you have to go to school every other week, right? Twice a month. And they had piss tests. Random. That shit was not fucking random. Shout out to the Steamfitters local apprenticeship program for piss testing me 16 times in five years. <laughs> so I would come in, this dude, like, he already knew my shit. He would piss test me all the time. Mm. And um, I would come up dirty because I didn't give a fuck. You know, you had the Trinis and the Jamaicans. They, they were like, yo, how do you smoke? You know, they're smoking around the school. Or like they'll go home after school and smoke and then not smoke so they don't stay in the system. There was like, you always try to finagle a way to do your drugs, you know? At me, I was like, I don't give a fuck, whatever. This is who I am. And it came to a point that three strikes, you're out. And I was coming up on my third strike. And at that third strike, I was like third year, right? The alcoholism was at a high level. I wasn't realizing that I was detoxing every morning until I drank at nine. Then the liquor came in. Then Bacardi, that was my devil. That was my girlfriend slash devil because that's what I loved was Bacardi. But you know how that started, the Bacardi. Since I live in Sunset, from the train station to my house, so now I'm a steam fitter. I'm feeling nice. I'm getting off the train on 53rd Street, right, 4th Avenue. I got to walk to 6th. So 53rd, I could buy the beer. By the time I get to 5th, the whole block, there's always somebody on the block. So I could get anything you want. I can get you heroin, coke, crack. I'll get you whatever the fuck you want. It's right there. I got to walk past it. So that store and, you know, bodegas, they had shots. The Dominicans had the Brugal shots. And then the Puerto Ricans had the Bacardi, the white, white or dark. You pick which one you want, left or right. So I would take shots. That was a continuance. Like I kept doing that and and it got more. Then I took singles. Then I went to doubles. Then I invented shit. I was the triple master. If you ask anybody in 53rd, the triplets, they call me Mr. Triplet. Then I switched it to quadruple. That's a four. Now I'm doing this. If I'm there, I take six shots, six quadruples. I invented the quintuple. The quintuple is five shots. That's pretty much those little clear plastic cups that you get. Bang! Especially if I do a bump. That's hand-to-hand. Boom, bing. Done. And um, my tolerance grew, bro. I got to a point that I had to drink a pint of Bacardi every day, bro. Sick. I had to drink when I got up. I drank at 9 o'clock. At lunchtime, we're going to the bar. And then coming home, I got to a point that I was drinking a liter of Bacardi every day. Wow. Every day. Did you even know? With Coke. Oh, but hold on. There's more. No. Then Xanax came into play. Holy shit. I think that's when the darkness, but I mean the darkness, the unmanageability, the 
I mean, I was still managing to get up and work, but, but fuck, like I dreaded those nights because wifey does not do drugs. She smokes pot, you know what I mean? But she's never tried anything of that sort. Were you guys married yet or no? No, we're not married, you know, per se. I mean, se, like, but, like, like living But no, together, we're together. Like yeah, we were together. So you she guys started were... living with me right away, like oh. at 20, like in, in our well-house basement. Oh, my God. You know what I mean? Yeah. She put up, God bless my wife, the blessing, the, the rock. I still, to this day, she probably, I don't deserve her. She rode through this whole she thing. She bro, oh, my God, dude. The bullshit that I fucking and and she's she's a tough chick. Like she went against all her own morals, bro. For whatever reason, and then we had our daughter. You know, but, it's it's funny because if you stop for a second and you think about it, right? Your mom and her morals, and your wife and her morals, and you and your dad. You're continuing the cycle, even though it's a little bit of a remix. This is what we know. Remember, I said I'll never be my dad. I'll never be my dad. Yeah. I looked in the mirror. I was oily skin, starting uh-huh. to swell because of the alcohol. You know, my liver's going. Seeping my out liver, of your my, pores. My liver's uh-huh. coming out. I'm fucking missing teeth. I won't be my father. I won't be my father. And that's exactly who I was, bro. Yeah. Like, dude, and he never lived with me. Like, he left me at nine. Almost like it's in your DNA. It's crazy. Yo, believe it or not, got people out there. Let me tell you, bro. You think you're not your parents. You're exactly who your parents are because that's all you know. That's all you were taught. You, yeah. you lived around them. Even if you didn't want to be like them, you got something from them. Could be good or bad. But you are your parents. Don't get it twisted, people out there. You are your parents. We are the ones that have to break that chain. We have to break that cycle. And take the good stuff and modify it. Yeah, yeah. To be like, okay. Even with the God stuff from my mom, I took that. Like, that was in me. My mom came, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying. My mom's been praying since I was 16 years old. Yeah. I'm 43 years old. I just got sober five years ago. God answered her prayer after so many years, bro. So you're telling me that God's not real. Yeah. God doesn't answer. It's on God's time. It's never on your time. Right. Folks, it's never. Whatever you pray for, you might not see results just yet. Yeah, so when did the bottom start showing up for real? So it was, was the Xanax, bro, because I was, I was falling asleep everywhere. <laughs> I wow. was knocking out my wife. Wow. But let me tell you, man, your boys, you think your boys are your boys until shit hits the fan because- Until you, be, until until you have shit a habit. Until shit hits the fan. Until, until you shit, have a habit. Until shit, because then they're your boys, and then all of a sudden, they're under, then they're all pointing the finger at you, laughing at you, bro. So they, they went from being a friend to, to you being a fucking clown. You know what I mean? Like, meanwhile, I thought we were boys. Instead of being like, yo, you good? No, they were like, yeah, look at- Right, look at her. You can't stop drinking this fucking idiot. Why can't you drink like us? Because you're not me, motherfucker. I'm an alcoholic, bro. I, I'm zero to a thousand. If you know hey Jesus, I'm zero. There's no in between, bro. Either we're doing this or we're not. So fucking 16 people in the corner all chilling and I'm around the corner sleeping on the fucking street, bro. On the sidewalk like a bum that my wife would have to come get me. Your perception of boys, boys, quotations, that shit ain't real, man. Your real friends are the person who's going to tell you to stop, man. Like, yo, stop your shit, bro. Like, what's wrong with you? Or snitch on you. Go tell your wife. Go tell, even though, oh, that's not a manly thing. You don't snitch on, yo, if someone's sick and suffering, that's the best thing you should do. Did you have anybody who was trying to do that, trying to help you at all? No, I mean, no, no. I got people who tell me, yo, thank God I told you all that advice, Jesus, when I'm sober. They think think that they saved me. They're like, yo, Jesus, all those talks we had. What? the fuck you talk i was like a leader in when we had those talks that's not a yeah. talk this gibberish my man then my wife just kind of like clocked out and then we had a daughter i had a, a, a special needs daughter she was born one pound four ounces mm. and even that that, it's that a miracle 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 even with that that wasn't gonna stop me no way no power greater than no mother no child no wife not your job obviously not your fucking job Nothing in life will make you stop until you're ready, until you make that conscious decision like, yo, what am I doing? Well, alcohol and drugs are stronger than love. That is your love. Yeah, that's it. That's what you think. It doesn't matter how much you you love your kids. That's all you know. That's all you know. You don't even know anything else. You don't even know how to love. How do you love? How can you love? If you don't love yourself, you're killing yourself. You're drinking this poison that people make you to believe that's what you need to have a great time you made yourself believe that yeah you're doing devil's dandruff like yeah 
When did it turn for well, you? Well, what happened was like, you know, my daughter was in the hospital for a year and a half mm. before she even came home. Yeah. So the doctors were like, do you need ACS? Yo, you okay? Because my wife was hands on. You ain't fucking with Cynthia. She should be an RN. That's how yeah. much she's learned in these NICU. Because she went from NICU to PQ to just a rehabilitation center. Robert Wood Johnson. Shout out to that center, bro. That that Robert, that was such a game. My, my wife lived in a Ronald McDonald house down the block of Rutgers University, bro. The nurses loved me until they were like, this is a problem. So when did you decide that you wanted to try and get sober? Or was there well, no, well, what, what happened, happened was, no, I guess, you know, that in the union, there's an EAP. That's an angel, bro. This guy saved so many people in this union is insane. Because again, most union workers do, do drugs, you know, either they smoke or drink or coke or whatever the fuck, you know, or painkillers. Forget mm. about everything else. That, that, thank God I really worked. I never got into that. Right. Xanax was just so I could go to sleep. But you're waking up, you're a zombie, and you're still drinking. Like, it, it was just like, I, I felt like a hamster in a wheel that never, you got to just jump off the wheel. So did the job intervene? So what happened was, the dude, I was on a lift, and this guy, that's my last man. I got to find him, bro. That's my last one. I swear I got everybody in the year. He pulled me off the lift. He saw me from, I had to be 30 feet in the air. He must have saw my, I don't know, my movements, my gestures. I don't know what he saw. He's like, kid, come down here. He's like, I'm not laying you off, kid. Listen, he grabbed me like from the shoulders like a man. Like He was like, he gripped me and stared me right in the eyes. Like, listen, kid, you, you need help. You need to go away, but you need to know that you need help. You need to realize for you, for your family, because everybody knows my story, you need help. So at this time, remember, I was getting piss tested at school. Yeah. Right? So my third strike was coming up. So I, I, I snitched on myself at school. I was like, listen, I got a problem. You know, and and let me tell you that EAP program, they picked me up the next day at seven in the morning, bro, right in my crib. Like it was crazy because I'm like, wait a minute, I need another day to drink. And again, even with that, I was doing it for someone else. Right. So that's how I got introduced. I didn't know what AA was. I didn't know what any of this shit was. I just knew it was a place for people to get help. You know, so I thought, all right, 28 days. I thought it was like a booster. Like that, that was for people who wanted to get right so they could drink again. Right. That's what I thought rehab was. Were they, were they bringing meetings into the rehab or anything? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were coming up. Guys like us, like, you know, union guys would come up, just guys who were there a few years before. They were bringing meetings, but I was disheveled, bro. I, I, was, I was looking, but I wasn't paying attention. Right. I was staring, but I was gazing. I just did it so I, people could shut the fuck up. Really. I did it to get the, the apprenticeship program off my back, to let them know I'm a problem, because they switched it up. They're like, oh, no, we're not going to get rid of you. We're going to help you. Which was like, ah, oh, a relief. That continued. I came, I, I drank. I, I was telling the story, I think to you or somebody else, like well, the, the guy who drove me back from rehab, instead of telling him to drop me off home, I told him to drop me off Salty Dogs, which is a bar. And I knew one of the doors on that avenue opened, so I fronted like I walked in because I used to do coke in that hallway. So he drops me off and I, 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 that boom, that was like my first rehab stand. I came home and I drank right away. And I did that, the second rehab. I did another one. Now I was doing it for my, because now my wife, she's done. She's fed up. Sick of my shit. I'm sleeping on the sofa for four years. I smell like a bum. I'm smelling up the house. She hates the way I smell. I can't even touch my daughter like that. Like, she's just like, that wants no part of anything of me. She's just like, just show me the money. You know, make sure you keep this roof over our head because I'm really going to fucking kill you. Like, I already want to kill you. Like, yo, she said, hey, Susan, I have moments that I, I wanted to poison you. Yeah. And we don't even realize how much traumatic that PTSD, how we bring that to our families without even knowing. My sister says she already accepted my death. And your wife stayed. That's even crazy. Well, she, thank, again, everything happens for a reason. If she had money, she probably would have left. Right. Like if there was money in the family or if she had guapi, I would have been dead. At least with her, I had to get home somehow. Yeah. So how many rehabs did you end up going Four. to? Four. Four. So the first, the first two were for that. One was for school. One, the second one was for wifey. You know, like, I'm going to do it for you. You know, I, I, I do want to help myself. I did want to stop, bro. I, it hurt. Waking up every morning. That, the night before, I, I truly was like, I, I, I don't ever want to do this. I would pray, bro. I'm like, God, how can I stop? Yeah, in the moment, like, people don't think that we are sincere, but we are extremely sincere. No, yeah. I, my, I wasn't lying to her. You didn't get it till you get it, but like 
but that's why way. sorry don't mean shit. Yeah. Guys, whoever's going to listen to this, if you don't stop saying sorry to your to your significant other, just show them the action. Because that sorry shit, how many times you said sorry? Come on, oh, guys. Let's think about it. Sorry is just like another, it means fuck you. Unless you show them. Right. Sorry means I'm never going to drink again. So what happened at the third rehab then? So the third one was like a two-week banger. I just want to kind of to just recover because right. I was tired of being sick and tired, you know? But now I'm introduced to you guys. Now I'm going to AA meetings. Now I'm going to AA meetings full of shit, bro. I would go to meetings just so I can go to the liquor store because my wife would allow me out one hour. That was the hour she let me out. I can go to the bar, never go to the meeting. Sometimes I go, I walk in late or whatever or leave early. Maybe an hour and 40 minutes that I, I could clear because you could leave a half hour early and then a half hour after. So that would be the time that I would stash all my bottles. Like from the walk from my house to the train station, I would hide so I would hide like six bottles because the next morning I would forget where I put them. But I can find one out of six until like, again, I had no relationship. I was just a walking show. Even she recorded me saying I'm not drunk. But I was so insane that I, I came in with a book bag from work and tried to hide the airplane bottles in my book bag when I know she's going to check my book bag. She almost became like a mom. She was TSA. She was FBI. She was DEA. She was my mom. Yeah. Bro, this girl, she could also, on top of being an RNN, she could be a detective, my man. She checked out, bro. Her family was like, you can't do this anymore. Jesus is never going to get it. Like, you've been with him for way too long. You How know? old is your daughter at the time? She's going to be like five. Yeah. And she needs your wife. Six. I started seeing the brother plot like on a way to take her out. Because now is, there's a lot of baggage when it comes to, to us. Because you got, it means wheelchair, machine, uh, milks, you know, like it, it's a lot. Right. You know, she was done. She checked out. I saw it in her eyes. She looked at me and she was like staring at somebody she didn't give a fuck about. She was like, I want you out, like out of my life. So we got to figure out a way to do this financially, you know what I mean? But she also loved me. Like she knew this person was in here, the person I am today. She somehow, I don't know how, she, she kept saying, I, hey, Seuss, I know you're not a bad guy. You have the devil in you. You have to make bad decisions. You're not a bad person. We're not bad people, guys. We just don't know how to stop or make, we keep the manipulation, the brain manipulation, you know? You can't even trust your own thinking at that time. No. Oh, no. So how how did you end up stopping for real? No, so so you know I had you guys in the rooms like yo he, he keep calling everybody just he just just that when you get to that room like that warmth like that it's okay you know you're not being judged like yo hey Sue just keep coming back please like you're such a good dude like that love and it didn't matter a race you know I'm in Bensonhurst now there wasn't too many there's like no Spanish people in there that shit didn't matter when I walk in I didn't feel that. I felt just love. Like, yo, just, I don't care who you are. Just keep coming. Hey, Jesus, keep coming. And I'm like, I see people like you getting years. I'm going to anniversaries. I'm like, man, what the fuck? And then again, so, you know, I went to rehab at 31 years old. And then I had the the, the rooms in me. And, and you know, so I, I had the program in me, but I was still manipulating. I was still saying, I'll do it my way. I'm not doing 90-90. I don't need to do 90-90. I don't need to do what you guys, I don't need the 12 steps, especially when you see that word God, like now I have to believe in God. And I always, you know, as a drunk, I always say I was atheist, but that's bullshit, bro. I always had God in my life, bro. That was just me. That was trying to be cool. Not only that, just that's me saying that because I wasn't ready to give up my devilish ways. I learned that shit like last year. It wasn't that I didn't believe in God as I wasn't ready for God. Mm. You get what I'm saying? Because when you go for God, it's like what this program is, so half measures availed us nothing. If I'm in all, I told you, I'm going to do from zero to a thousand. So if I'm in, I'm in. You know what I'm saying? I ain't going to half ass it. You guys taught me that. AA has taught me that. Like half measures has availed us nothing. So when did you surrender completely? Bro, so I went, to, oh God, shout out to my sponsor that used to come to my house and I was still drinking and he still was taking me through the steps until one day he was like, dude, you're drinking, bro. I can't do this shit no more. And this is a man with a family, bro. He would be exhausted coming from work. He had like a newborn kid. I amended him though. He's, he's cool. He's just happy. I'm sober. He was like really ecstatic about that. But he's like, yo, I was trying to do what you guys were telling me, but I was half-assing it. You know, I got me the sponsor, but just to say I had a sponsor, not to do the fucking work. And he would come to my house. I'm just staring at him. I'm thinking of every, I'm not even paying attention to this dude, bro. It was crazy. I'm like on my phone, like a, like 
again, the insanity, you know, the things that alcoholics do, we, we don't care. We're not worried about the other person, right? We're worried about our, ourselves and that's it. I kept coming, bro. The attraction of just people like, and my wife's eyes just checked out. When I looked in her eyes, she, there was nothing there. There was zero love for me, companionship wise. And then that last time I said, I'm going to rehab. And this time I'm, I'm, I surrender. I surrender, bro. I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my daughter. My daughter wasn't, oh, she, she doesn't talk. And she didn't even want me, bro. She would push me away like when I was drunk. Mm. Like I saw it, like her actions was enough to tell me like, get away from me that you're annoying. And that shit would fucking kill me. I'd be like, how does not my daughter love me? She doesn't even talk. Like how does she even know? You know, I would tell myself when I'm drunk. And then I look in the mirror and I see my dad missing. T- I'm just like a mess, dude. Oh my God. I'm like, how, how can I stop? I didn't know how to stop. That's because I didn't want to listen. I knew how to stop. I just, I guess I wasn't ready until that, like the last run, I, you know, I fell asleep on the beach. It was like 99 degrees and a hundred back to back. And I got burned and I was missing for two days. And when my wifey found me, it was just, it was bad. And I was detoxing on my sofa, but with like second degree sunburns on me. So not only am I detoxing, I'm like pus bubbles, I'm shaking. I thought I was dying. I couldn't eat, throwing up, bro. I felt like a pure tech. Mm. I was teched out. And um, I couldn't even, I would drink water and just throw a bile, like yellow bile. The insides of the remainings of my stomach was coming out. I had nothing in me, bro. I was soulless. I was godless. I was just dead, a walking zombie, bro. And I listened to, I was like, you know what, man? I'm going to tell you, Joe, spiritual Joe. Shout out to him because, you know, there's certain things you get from these rooms that, you know, you don't listen to people because you don't fucking want to, which is these suggestions. They're not real suggestions. They're things that you should do. It's a nice way for an alcoholic so you don't have to feel like it's like authority, like someone telling you what to do because we don't like people telling us what to do. So they put it in a, in a nice form and say we suggest. So the suggestions means like, yo, listen, this is what you got to do. Straight up, right? And uh, because if I took the suggestions eight years, I mean, when I was 31 years old, 32 years old, I'll be in such a different place, you know? Joe was like, Jesus, he has has a real funny accent. Like, hey, Jesus, listen to me, kid. I see you coming in here suffering all the time. I've seen you for years coming in and out of here. Why don't you give yourself 90 days, kid? And how about this? I'll make you a deal. On the 91st day, I'll buy you the drinks. We go to the bar and I'll buy you the drinks. You know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah. I was like, you know what? Bet. Yo, that's what made me do my 90-90 after six years of struggling, bro. And yo, I did it. I did and I finally started doing what you guys wanted me to do. And the first one was the 90 days, 90 meetings in 90 days. Saved my life, bro. So as, as I was going there, I finally got that clarity. And you were showing up early to meetings. Bro, I was showing up. I that was yo, a big thing. because I had the- no car. I was showing up on a bus. Yeah. I was showing up in snow. I was riding my bike, bro. I told myself, dude, you're getting to that meeting. I don't care if the bus is stopped. Then I'm riding my bike. Like, I'm getting to a meeting. Pouring rain. I could be the only one in the meeting drenched. Me and the chairperson. I don't care. I promised myself do this. That was the promise. Get the 90. And then, then I, I kind of told myself, like, yo, I'll go drink. Fuck it. If this shit don't work. I, I, and the way he put it, those little, his words were like, it processed. Like, it was like, you, you know what else he said? He was like, your body needs a break. Give yourself a little break. And I was like, you know what? I can't rehab. I already tried. You know what I'm saying? So rehab is, wasn't going to change anything. I already knew what was going to happen up there. I could get clean, but I wasn't going to stay clean. I had to realize, because again, I'm going to meetings. So I had to realize what I have to do different. And what I had to do different, guys, was, was plain and simple. Stop thinking. It's that fucking simple. Stop thinking. Stop listening to your, your voice, your demons. They're going to they're gonna steer you to a bad place. They're real good saying, yo, you can have a beer. It's real good. You, you can have one without your sponsor knowing. It's real easy to react on that thought. So I had to tell myself, stop thinking. And you started listening to your I friends. I started listening. Your friends, all of a sudden, now you're making friends. Like I would chair the Tuesday meeting 
And like it'd be me and then the coffee maker and Free Willy would show up and you would always start, I don't know where you start showing up early. Even though we've seen you shuffling around for so long, you were different. And I think you're very lucky because some people that- Well, you know what the difference was? I wasn't doing it for somebody anymore. Right. I was doing it for myself. Yeah. That was the huge difference. Like, yo- and your teeth were jacked up. And my teeth were jacked They were jacked up. They weren't jacked up. They were on the back of the milk carton, bro. Missing, my man. Bro, they were missing. You but know? you kept coming. But I kept coming. That wasn't me. That was God keep showing me, like, yo, let's keep going, Jesus. Keep going. Because, you know, it's the things I saw in you guys. Your happiness. Like, why are these dudes always happy and smiling? And you guys even took me. I remember they took me to shoot pool. I couldn't hold a pool stick. Yo, I was so crazy. I told them, I, I'm going to have a cigarette. I don't even smoke. I ran outside because it was on Avenue. It was King's, King's Highway. They, I knew where the liquor store was. I ran. I ran. Bought a pint. Ran back. And I'm like, I'm going to guzzle this shit. But I'm like, wait a minute. I want a group of Alcoholics Anonymous people. They're not going to smell me? What are you kidding me, Asus? What's, what is wrong with you, bro? I threw that shit. I threw it in the garbage. Ching, broke it, whatever. Pissed off. But you guys... Taught me how to live again. They were bringing me to these places and being part of this fellowship because they were teaching me how to live without the drink. I didn't even know how to think. I was, I was like a baby. I, everything was, was just different and new for me. Did you start doing the work? Yes. I stopped thinking and started doing. I didn't even care what I was thinking. If you told me, hey, Sus, stand on one hand... And hold the, the promises and another and, and read them upside down, balancing. I was going to do that because I, I was tired of suffering and being sick, bro. And I was ready to lose my family. So I, there was two choices. Either I was going to go all in or I was going to go all out. And out meaning dead. That's the other choice. Right. And again, you want to be a dad? I never wanted to be that guy. And I am that guy. How can I break the chains of a typical Sunset Puerto Rican dude? How can I break that? How can I not be this person anymore? How can that stop? Juice guys taught me everything, bro. All right, so I did all the suggestions. Got the sponsor. I got the sponsor. I was always looking for a sponsor those first few years, and it was always trying to find somebody that was me, Spanish and from the hood. That's what I was looking for, like somebody like me. And I was like, nah, not this time. Do everything different. I chose someone who was quiet. And humbled. He wasn't Spanish. <laughs> you know, I chose someone that God chose for me. Because it was like, I looked at him. He said something. His eyes said something. I asked him to sponsor me. And then I started really doing it. Now, check this out, guys. Since Jesus thinks that what Jesus knows is the best, is the best. <laughs> Let me show you about humble. So I started going through the work. I was Mr. AA. I was going to every meeting. I was going to this meeting. Doing great. And there was a Christmas party. For the union, I was working and there was a Christmas party. I said, you know what? I could have two beers. My sponsor won't know. That quick. Wow. Boom, boom. The door's open, kid. The train was has arrived. But let me tell you, I had six months clean. Six months clean, which was bullshit. There's another bullshit. Guys, again, manipulation. Me trying to do my own way. Every time I got paid, I had one Heineken because I thought that I can have one. And that was me thinking, telling myself, like, you can have one because you can control this. Mm. Because I think even with those six months, I was telling myself that I'm going to learn how to drink responsibly. I'm not just going to get sober. I'm going to learn how to drink. So I would have one beer every Wednesday at the taco place because I would get tacos. Wednesday was the night my wife didn't cook. So I would get stuff from Sunset before going to the Heights. Get food, whatever, Spanish food, Mexican food, whatever food they didn't have in Dyke Heights. You know what I'm saying? So I would get that and, and have one Heineken because I told myself, you're the boss. The Heineken's not the boss. You're the boss. For the six months that I was telling my sponsor I wasn't drinking, right? Right. So then I relapsed at that Christmas party. I thought I was normal. I had two Heinekens. The first one, it was a guzzle. Pink, because it was just like refreshing. Then the second one was like, this is the chill one, because they don't know I'm an alcoholic. They don't really know. They're all alcoholics, too. They don't give a fuck. I ran to the liquor store and got a, two pints. I, I guzzled. This is all within 10 minutes of the first sip. Seven minutes, probably. Got to the liquor store. I told them again, I'm having a cigarette. I'll be right outside. Ran to the liquor store because I don't want them to know my alcoholism. Guzzled the pint. Again, guys, not drinking for six months. I guzzled the pint and had a, another pint in my back pocket so I could drink while I'm having the beer at the bar with them. I finished that. 
lo and behold, I'm on my way to 53rd Street. Back to the stomping ground, baby. Mm. So I'm going wa- backwards. I'm walking. I'm walk coming out the train. So from fourth to fifth, it's a long, it's an uphill walk. My fucking the the mental insanity and the obsession. My brain was all. I was like, I felt like anxiety, like heart attack. But my body's taking me to the, my boy who sells coke. Yo, I'm, as I'm getting to Fifth Avenue, I look over and I see the bus, and I have a Metro card, unlimited. I usually do the month or the week or whatever. And I look at the coke dude because he's right across the street, very visible. That was the that was the moment. That was like, I gotta go home. Because if I would have went to get that back of coke, I wasn't going home. I do a bump. I can't go home for another four hours. I gotta wait till it comes down. I can't. That would have been an all nighter for sure. I jump on the bus. I went home. The best thing I ever did. Oh my God, thank you, Lord. The best thing I did was snitch on myself. You know, I told my wife, I'm like, listen, I don't think we have to call my sponsor, but I drank to this. She was like, what? You better call your fucking sponsor right now. You better call your fucking out here. Put up my fucking speaker. Bro, she was flip mode squad. I didn't think she was going to get that crazy because I, I didn't drink a lot. And I called Chris, you know, I was like, yo, dude, I relapsed. And his calm was so fucking weird. He was like, yeah? I was like, yeah. He's like, what'd you drink? I was like, yeah, I had two pints and some beers. Yeah? He was like, all right. That's cool, man. He's like, all right, so meet me tomorrow. We'll finish up fourth step. I was nice. like, that, that, that calm, which fucked me all up because I'm like going through pure mental. I couldn't sleep. Sleep was shot because people thought I had it. I was going to every meeting. You know what I'm saying? They were like, oh, he finally got his first six months after six years of trying this shit. Then there was another level of humility. God was showing me. Dude, your way is wrong, bro. Whatever you think is wrong. Stop thinking again. Just listen. Be the observer. That's when my when I told my character defect, like, yo, Jesus, you need to shut the fuck up. You're done. I'm tired of the old Jesus, like, telling me what to do. I need to do what God wants me to do. I need to do what this room has been doing from since 1935. Whatever Bob and Bill created here to the graces of God, because this is a spiritual program, I found life. I found God. I found, I found myself. You found peace. Peace. And that's when my journey started. That's when it was like, let go and let God. Stop thinking, Jesus. Your thinking is wrong. To this day, I got five years old, but my thinking's still wrong, bro. I'll tell you right now, you probably heard some shit on the way here where we were talking. You're like, it's just easy. <laughs> You're getting way ahead of yourself. But those are my thoughts because I'm so used to doing it. 35 years of doing the same shit. You think I'm going to be human or, or normal in five years? No. We're human, bro. We're always going to make mistakes. The difference is, what are you going to do when you make those mistakes? Or... Can you avoid those mistakes? Because now you have a chance to pause and think because this program has taught me that you have a choice today. How do you want people to remember you by? Because I buried mad people in this program, bro. And what do I say? (sighs) Damn, what a shame. This kid was a good kid. Or do you want to die when it's your time to die of natural causes? I don't want to die drunk. I don't want to die an alcoholic. I don't want to die with the devil's arm around wrapped around my neck. I want to die free, bro. I want to die with God in my life, with dignity. I want people to say, yo, this fucking guy right here in this tombstone, you see this tombstone? I want the person to tell the next person, he stopped. He's not his father. He is not his father. Finally. He, he broke the chains. He's yeah. not your typical sunset dude no more. We're just a product of our environment. But today we can make choices. AA has found, Bob and Bill found a way and created this 12-step program that, yo, I could tell you, you don't have to be an alcoholic to do the 12 steps. I feel like you could do the 12 steps as a regular human out there and you'll find so much, you'll learn so much about yourself. You know, the rooms will keep you sober, but the steps will set you free, period. If you do them honestly, vigorously. I also think that the steps teach you how to be honest. It's a lot to ask somebody to really be honest, but once you start doing some inventories, once you have the humility where somebody can say, hey, Seuss, you're full of shit, and then you don't run away and you don't get offended, you get that idea like, maybe I don't have all the answers. Then the honesty happens, you know, but like 
I think that you come a long way. And I, and I used to love going to your anniversary and seeing your kid. And my mom. Yeah. Bro, guys, your first year anniversaries, celebrate them and make sure you show up to someone's first year anniversary. You'll never get better juice than that. When you see the family connection to the alcoholic. <sighs> and after a year, it just comes a year and it'll, a day. It'll blow your mind. Yeah. Yeah. After a year is a year and a day. Like this is a, this is a lifestyle. Amen to that. This is a lifestyle. Anyway, guys, look, we're going to wrap it up. We sprayed the corner. It was incredible. We're going to drop this as soon as we can, hopefully for the holiday season, to let all you other crazy Puerto Ricans know that there's another way. There is another way. All right, guys. Peace. Peace.